there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. So far in this series, we've concentrated on the good news from the Rococo. Travel, pleasure, the pursuit of happiness. Although it lasted most of the 18th century, the Rococo was art's happy hour, when much fun was had by many. Unfortunately, there's a downside when you spend as much energy as the Rococo did running away from reality, there comes a time when unreality becomes the norm, when common sense gives way to madness and the darkness sets in. And that's what this film is about, the madness of the Rococo, the monsters that crawl out of the dark when reason has had too much to drink and the artistic imagination goes on the prowl. We're going to see some very queer things in this film. Goya, for instance, was the ever an artist who explored the dark more energetically than Goya. Or Messerschmitt, Franz Xavier Messerschmitt from Austria. What kind of a sculptor, in what kind of an age, produces art like this? And then there's Longhi. Ah yes, Longhi. Observer-in-chief of Venetian decadence. Who looked beneath the mask and found another mask. So all that's coming up as we explore Rococo's dark side. But first, we're going to Britain, where the madness flourished particularly fiercely, and where some very strange people made some very strange appearances in some very strange art. Allow me to introduce you to Sir Francis Dashwood, libertine, fantasist and inveterate Rococo dresser-up. This, believe it or not, is Dashwood too, in his guise as a Turkish Sultan. And here he is again as the Pope, worshipping a topless goddess. But the maddest of these mad Rococo depictions of Sir Francis Dashwood is surely this one, painted by William Hogarth. Dashwood as a monk, pretending to be Saint Francis of Assisi. In most countries, a man like this would be arrested and put into a mental home. But in Rococo Britain, he was encouraged to enter politics, held several important government posts and eventually became Chancellor of the Exchequer. Dashwood's career has a familiar ring to it. He went to Eton, painted here by Canaletto, where he made his important political friendships. 
he was a Tory. And in his younger days, before he became Chancellor of the Exchequer, Dashwood was a keen member of various drinking clubs, including the most notorious of them all, the Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club was a gentleman's club with a religious bent. Its members, who included many of the leading politicians of the time, dressed up as monks, and they called themselves Brother. They met in these spooky caves in West Wickham, where they managed somehow to combine anti-Catholicism with drinking too much and wenching. No one knows for sure what the Hellfire Club got up to down here. It's all very mysterious, but some information did seep out. Dashwood, dressed as St Francis, would lead the pretend monks through a series of outrageous religious ceremonies, mocking the Catholics. Then they'd all get immensely drunk and turn their attention to the prostitutes, or nuns as they called them, that invited along to their black mass. <laughs> So here we are, slap in the middle of the so-called Enlightenment. Yet here is half the government dressed up as monks, drinking themselves stupid and chasing after pretend nuns in a cave. That's why I love the Rococo. It's completely potty. According to rumours, Hogarth was also a member of the Hellfire Club. He was definitely associated with it in some way. And in this very strange portrait of Dashwood as St Francis, Hogarth shows the Chancellor of the Exchequer worshipping a crucified Venus. Instead of a Bible, he's reading a pornographic novel. And the fruit at his feet has taken a naughty form and looks like a woman's buttocks. Hogarth, who's usually thought of as the first truly great British painter and who looked more like his pug than his pug did, was another Rococo frequenter of drinking clubs. In 1732, he became a founder member of something called the Sublime Order of Roast Beefs, a patriotic eating club and drinking club. When mighty roast beef was the Englishman's food, it ennobled our hearts and it enriched our blood. Our soldiers were brave and our courtiers were good. They met in an upstairs room at the old Covent Garden Theatre, where they drank too much beer and sang nationalistic songs about the potency of British beef. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. <laughs> Our fathers of old were robust, stout and strong and kept open house with good cheer all day long. <laughs> Which made them you know that boozy, burpy, rude tone you get in Hogarth's art? It's the tone of the tavern. In the modern world, you still get it at football matches. All that swearing, mocking of the opposition, the jingoism. Sully those honours which once shone in fame. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. 
Hogarth's noisy nationalism is usually brushed over by his defenders. It's all good fun, they say. He was just being boisterous. I'm not sure about that. With Hogarth, the devil is always in the details. And in Calais Gate, his most famous picture, there's a lot going on that's very unpleasant. Calais Gate, or the roast beef of old England as it's properly called, shows a busy French street, with Hogarth himself lurking in the crowd. You can actually see him there in the picture, about to be arrested, and all this is based on a real event. In 1748, Hogarth went over to Calais, and while sketching the city gates, he was detained as a spy by the French police. This infuriated him immensely, and as soon as he got back to London, he got his revenge by painting this picture. Now, the city walls were part of Calais' defences, and the British had only just finished their war with the French, so drawing the city defences at such a time was very foolish. Of course he was going to get arrested. But what's really unpleasant here is the religious nastiness of this picture, the dark, anti-Catholic ideas that are being expressed here. Hogarth has set his scene in the build-up to Easter, Lent, when French Catholics were not supposed to eat any meat. So the British taverns in Calais, hungry for the roast beef of old England, had to import it specially from home. And this great slab of British beef has just arrived at the port. This fat French friar here, fingering the side of beef, he's quite funny. And these hungry French soldiers having to make do with a thin gruel, they're pretty funny too. But what isn't so funny is what's going on in the rest of the picture. Right here at the front on the left, there are three hideous nuns worshipping a dried out fish. The fish, remember, was a traditional symbol of Christ. So this comic fish's face is a giggling and perverse reference to the true face of Christ that was said to have been left on Veronica's veil when she wiped his dying face. In a Catholic Mass, at the climax of the Mass, the moment of communion, the holy wafer and the goblet of wine become the body and blood of Jesus. It's the centre of Catholic belief, this idea of transubstantiation. And that is what Hogarth is mocking here. At the back of the picture, a Catholic priest outside a tavern is handing out the communion wafer to his congregation. While the English eat good old English beef, the French get Jesus as a wafer. And right at the top, in the most unpleasant detail of all, a crow has landed on a cross and its hungry beak has begun pecking uselessly at Jesus' symbolic body. In France, at Lent, even the crows are hungry for a bit of flesh.
So beneath the Rococo's jollity, there was darkness. And beneath its beauty, there was darkness too. Have you ever wondered why women try to make their faces whiter by using makeup? It's a status thing. Goes back long before the Rococo. If you were poor, you worked outdoors, right? So you got suntanned. And the moment somebody saw you, they knew you were poor. With paleness, the opposite was true. If you were pale, you stayed indoors, enjoying your leisure. So your skin was white, a condition that found particular favour in the Rococo. It wasn't just the women either. There were plenty of Michael Jacksons out there as well, trying desperately to look less dark than they were. But it was the women who really suffered, and among whom the fiercest tragedies were enacted. See this mirror, a beautiful Georgian mirror, made by William Linnell in 1759. This mirror used to belong to a famous Rococo beauty called Maria Gunning. Maria Gunning came from Ireland. Her family was poor, so she became an actress and wowed them with her looks. First in Dublin and then in London. She arrived in London in 1751. She was 18 and quickly became the Angelina Jolie of her times, a celebrity actress famed for her beauty. When Maria went by in her carriage, crowds would line the streets in the hope of glimpsing her. She got so famous, her shoemaker began charging people sixpence just to see her shoes. So it didn't take her long to find herself an earl. And in 1752, she married the Earl of Coventry and settled down to a life of being beautiful. This is the actual mirror he bought for her, which used to hang above the mantelpiece in her dressing room. Every day, Maria Gunning would spend hours painting her face, getting ready to appear before her doting public. And soon enough, that's what killed her. The whiteness she used was made of lead white, which achieves excellent coverage. But the lead began combining with the moisture in her skin to form an acid that began eating away at her face. To cover up these patches where her skin had fallen off, Maria Gunning would apply even more whitener. The rouge on her cheeks, a fashion imported from France where the country girl look became briefly popular, was made from lead paste and cinnabar, a waste product of mercury mining. So rouge gave you lead poisoning and mercury poisoning. As for her lipstick, Maria Gunning liked to use Mercuric Fucus, a seaweed extract with a particularly high concentration of mercury. So the acid ate away at her skin, the lead poisoned her, the mercury seeped into her veins, and as the sores grew ever more visible, so more and more makeup was needed to cover them. She died at the age of 27 and spent her final year in a darkened room where no one could see her. 
this lovely George II giltwood overmantel mirror, given to her by her husband, with its exuberant acanthus scrolls and its brimming basket of flowers, would have seen all this. And the poor mirror must have thought to itself, human beings, eh? You couldn't make them up. Back in Venice, history clearly had it in for the city of masks. And the good times were now numbered. The pesky Dutch and English had stolen the most important trade routes and Venice was no longer the gateway to the east. Its naval power had crumbled, so as we saw in film one, the one about travel, Rococo Venice needed to reinvent itself as a tourist trap. <laughs> to attract the louche but increasingly crucial grand tourists, the Serenissima had turned itself into the international center of European naughtiness. If drinking was your vice, or gambling, or chasing after women and men, then Venice was the place for you. The best time to go was, of course, carnival time, when you could wear a mask and be as decadent as you wanted. No one knew who you were. Fortunately for us, to record this immense social naughtiness, Venice managed to produce one more great painter. He was born Pier Antonio Falca, but we know him better by his Rococo stage name, Pietro Longhi. Longhi was the Venetian Hogarth a satirical, nosy Parker keeping his eye on his fellow citizens. But because he was a Venetian, Longhi could never be as burpy and beery as Hogarth. Longhi's tactic was to charm the truth out of you. He'd giggle and he'd sweet talk till he was close enough to peep behind the mask. You could wear a mask in Venice from St. Stephen's Day, that's the 26th of December, till Shrove Tuesday, so that's three months or so. And also from October the 5th to Christmas, so that's another three months. So for Nero's Dam, six months of the year, the Venetians could go about pretending they weren't who they were. The Venetian mask had various purposes. In the cramped streets of Venice, it was a way of hiding in full view of your fellows. And it was particularly useful in the gambling dens, where no one knew who you were or how much you owed them. Women wore a mask called a moretta, which means the dark lady. They were oval, and you kept them in place with your teeth biting onto a little button inside. So a woman in a moretta couldn't speak without her mask falling off, giving away her identity and Venetian women evolved a subtle language of silent flirtation, an inclination of the head, a flutter of the eyelashes, a nod, a wink. <laughs> the men, meanwhile, wore a white mask called a bauta, shaped like a face, except for the bottom which stuck out like a projecting chin, so you could eat and drink and gossip 
while wearing it. The Venetian bauta wasn't just worn at carnival time, it had a political role too. Venetian nobles wore them at important decision-making events, so they could cast their votes anonymously. But the chief role of the mask was to hide the darkness within. Venetian society had grown decadent and rotten, and it didn't want everyone to know. This interesting longy painting, called The Charlatan, shows a phony doctor flogging his wares at carnival time in the dark arcades of the Doge's palace. But the real charlatan here is the anonymous nobleman in the foreground, <laughs> who makes a crude grab for a passing woman's skirt. We'll never know exactly what's going on in Longhi's art. His symbolism is too twisted and Venetian. We've lost touch with too many of its secret meanings. But one thing we can be sure of is that there are no heroes in his pictures. No one we should look up to. So what have you got? In Longhi's art, the corrupt, the flighty, the ridiculous have elbowed out the gods and the heroes and grabbed the leading roles. In Rococo Venice, it wasn't the meek who inherited the earth, but the schemers, the mountebanks, the charlatans. So the pleasure capital of Europe was awash with naughtiness. Whatever your vice, Venice catered for it. But vices cost money. And if you didn't have any and got into debt, then they sent you somewhere very Rococo. Prison. The prison island of Santo Stefano a busy Rococo location with a hellish history. The Italians have been sending people to Santo Stefano since Roman times. Nero's wife, Octavia, was exiled here. A couple of thousand years later, this is where Mussolini sent his political prisoners. But it got really interesting in Rococo times, when Santo Stefano led the way in prison architecture. Prisons played a huge part in the Rococo. They were crucial in literature, for instance. Casanova, that archetypal Rococo seducer, was in and out of prison, and his life story is full of prison escapades. The Marquis de Sade was another one, an archetypal Rococo rogue who did all his best work locked up. So the Rococo specialised in prisons. And here at Santo Stefano, there's a unique survival of the Rococo's biggest and darkest prison idea. You must have heard of Jeremy Bentham. He's one of the Rococo's weirdest presences. And he's still with us. Or at least, bits of him are. Bentham left his corpse to University College London. And every day 
his Rococo skeleton goes on display, encased in a pretend body, stuffed with horse hair. As for his head, well, they keep that in a box, and it only gets taken out on special occasions. Bentham was a social philosopher, constantly thinking up better ways for us to live. And he invented a new way of thinking called utilitarianism. Utilitarianism's big idea was that usefulness brought happiness. So everything should be really, really useful, especially a prison. According to Bentham, the greatest happiness of the greatest number was the measure of right and wrong. So whatever made a prison work best, that's what you need to do. So he invented a new type of prison called a panopticon. And he persuaded the English government to help him develop it. And his plan was to build one of these in London, exactly where Tate Britain is today. And it would have looked much like this. The Panopticon was round, and its big idea was that the prisoners on the perimeter could be spied on constantly by the guards watching them from the centre. It was all about surveillance. How could a few people keep track of lots of people? In a panopticon, the cells went all the way round. And in the middle was an observation tower patrolled by the guards. And this observation tower had blinds in it, Venetian blinds, as it happens. So the guards could watch the prisoners, but the prisoners could never be sure if they were being watched or not. It's a very sinister idea. What Bentham was trying to engineer with his Rococo panopticon was a situation in which the prisoners controlled themselves. In their imaginations, they always believed they were being watched, so they could never feel unwatched. And of course, Bentham was right. The modern world is being invented here and its sophisticated surveillance. With the CCTV camera, the building doesn't have to be round anymore. But the Panopticon's big idea that the few can spy on the many has survived. Once he'd invented his panopticon, Bentham wanted to expand its use. Hospitals could be based on this model, he said. Madhouses. And even schools. So as the Rococo slipped ever deeper into the blackness of its own ending, the craziness of Jeremy Bentham's daft ideas ceased slowly to appear so crazy and began to look more and more like the norm. When the Rococo uncorked the inner man and pushed him out onto art's stage, it made public bits of the mind that had previously remained private. This is Vienna, where Sigmund Freud would later tunnel so invasively into the human psyche. What, I wonder, 
would Freud have made of the Rococo mindset that produced these? These were made by the Viennese sculptor Franz Xaver Messerschmitt. And I know this is the Rococo, and there are all sorts of private fears and desires came bubbling up from the inner man, but still, they're particularly creepy, aren't they? Born in the German Alps in 1736, Messerschmitt began his career as a conventional sculptor working for the Viennese court. Here's his portrait of the emperor, Francis I. And here's the empress, Maria Theresa. Competent? Yes. Special? No. So it was all going swimmingly. He had a prestigious position at the court when suddenly something went wrong. In about 1770, Messerschmitt began having hallucinations and bouts of paranoia. And for no discernible reason, he began making these. In 1774, he applied for a professor's job at the Vienna Academy of Art and was turned down. Messerschmitt, they said, was suffering from confusion in the head. So he left for Pressburg, nowadays called Bratislava, and for the final 10 years of his life, these were all he did. He called them his character heads. Some were sculpted from marble, others cast from lead. They're basically self-portraits, each one featuring a different grimace in what Messerschmitt claimed was a full catalogue of the canonical grimaces of the human face. In 1781, a German writer called Friedrich Nikolai visited Messerschmitt in his studio. It's the only eyewitness account of him there is. And Messerschmitt explained to Nikolai that he was suffering from intense pains in his abdomen. The illness has since been diagnosed as Crohn's disease. And to relieve these sharp pains, Messerschmitt would pinch himself hard in the stomach, and then he'd record the expression on his face in these extraordinary heads. There was more. Scattered about the studio were bits and pieces of occult imagery and books on magic. Messerschmitt told Nikolai he was a follower of Hermes Trismegistus, the ancient occult god whose name has given us the modern adjective Hermetic. According to Hermes Trismegistus, our duty on Earth is to pursue a universal balance. As above, so below was his doctrine. Unfortunately, Messerschmitt's sculptures had angered the spirit of proportion an ancient being who protected these occult secrets. And so angry was the spirit of proportion with Messerschmitt for making these that he began visiting him at night and subjecting him to terrible tortures. This particular head, the beak it's called, is a record of one of these ghastly nights and of what happened in the mind of Franz Xaver Messerschmitt when the spirit of proportion commenced his torture. Only the Rococo 
could have come up with an artistic storyline like this one. That craze for wearing masks and costumes that we saw in Longhi's paintings, swapping identities, pretending you're someone else, that wasn't just a Venetian craze. It caught on all over the Rococo world, particularly in France. <laughs> You'll remember in the last film how we admired the art of Antoine Watteau and his dreamy fête galante. All those mysterious couples flirting, strolling, searching for love. Who are they? And why are they dressed like that? <laughs> you should recognise him. He's Harlequin. And he appears in lots of Votto paintings. And so does he. Piero. And they're all characters from the Commedia dell'arte. The Commedia dell'arte was a type of travelling theatre, originally from Italy, which toured Rococo Europe, mounting spontaneous, on-the-spot entertainments. They'd turn up at your village and put on a show, like fairs today or the circus, and the main characters were always the same, Harlequin, Piero, but the stories were constantly changing, improvised specially for the day. The usual explanation for the presence of these Commedia dell'arte characters in Watto's art is that they're part of the Rococo's escape from reality. A symbolic blurring of the divide between real life <laughs> and the theatre. <laughs> There's definitely some of that going on. Votto's art raises intriguing questions about the nature of reality and all that. But I think the reason why the people in his pictures are wearing all these mixed-up costumes is much simpler. They're attending a fancy dress ball. Masquerades were all the rage in Rococo, France. They were notoriously decadent, full of flirtation and intrigue. <laughs> and the most popular costumes to wear at a masquerade, the ones you could rent most easily off the shelf, were the Commedia dell'arte costumes, which everyone knew and recognised. If you were going to a fancy dress ball in the Rococo era, you hired a Commedia dell'arte costume. And they were still popular a few centuries later. As Bertie Wooster puts it in Right Ho Jeeves by P.G. Woodhouse. For costume parties, every well-bred Englishman dresses as Piero. One Watto painting in particular his masterpiece, I think, pokes about so interestingly in the deeper meanings of this Rococo identity swapping. A gangly young man in a Piero costume stands before us looking nervous. The costume doesn't fit properly. It's too big for him, like an off-the-peg morning suit hired cheaply for a wedding. In Commedia dell'arte shows, Piero, the sad clown, is always chasing after the beautiful Columbine. But she prefers the dashing Harlequin. You know how women always go for the bad boys. So she rejects poor Piero over and over and over again. 
Unlucky in love. Unlucky in everything. Watto's Piero is so palpably human and vulnerable. Yes, he's had a go at being someone else in his ill-fitting costume. But he's not very good at it, is he? This isn't humanity disguised, it's humanity revealed. What we've got here, and this is so brilliant, is a painter who's using costumes not to escape reality, but to confront it. These days, the sad clown has become a bit of a cliché. But the Rococo invented him, and Watto's Piero was the first and greatest of them. So it was all getting darker. All over Europe, the naysayers were taking over art, dredging up the black stuff from their imaginations. And the loudest no's could be heard in Spain when the incomparable Goya turned up on the front line of art. Every now and then, an artist comes along who doesn't just do things differently, but who actually tears up the rule book, reinvents what art can and should do. Goya was one of those. His first notable successes in art were the Rococo tapestries he designed for the Royal Court in Madrid. They're supposed to be jolly and sweet in a typical Rococo fashion. And some of them are. But others aren't. The tapestry designs brought Goya to the attention of the Spanish royal family. As with most royal families, they were hungry for artistic immortality. And so, foolishly, very foolishly, they invited Goya to paint their portraits. The result was a display of royal mockery on a scale unimaginable in any other epoch. Only at the tail end of the Rococo could Goya have got away with this damning portrayal of Charles IV and his family, with its startling determination to tell it like it is. And just look what he made of the next king in the line, Ferdinand VII, the ugliest king in art. The desperate Dan Chin, the half-formed mouth, the Wolverine sideburns. If this were your king, you'd want a republic, wouldn't you? Goya was born without the flattery gene. He was incapable of diplomacy. And when he looked at the world around him and saw stupidity, evil, darkness, he just couldn't help himself. He had to point it out to us. In his private paintings, the ones he made for himself, it all comes tumbling out. Here's the Casa de Locos, the madhouse. A terrifying stone jail where the crazies have taken over. And all manner of unmentionable acts are performed in the dark. Here's the Inquisition. Come to church to judge the dunces and then to torture them. And here's a procession of penitents in Holy Week who don't need the Inquisition to torture them because they're so keen to torture themselves. That's Goya there, 
asleep, slumped over his desk, with all these monsters pouring out of his head. The sleep of reason produces monsters is written on the desk. This was going to be the title plate of the Rococo's most inventive and brilliant torrent of darkness. The great suite of etchings known as Goya's Caprichos. The original copper plates from which these etchings were made are now found in the Academy of San Fernando in Madrid. If you get a chance to see them, take it, because they bring you so close to Goya. The caprichos are always exciting, but they're particularly exciting when you press your nose against them and savour the beautiful scratchings of Goya's Burin. This is graphic art of spectacular freedom and wildness. In this dark cascade of 80 scabrous images describing the horrors of the world around him, Goya poured out all his disappointment, his hatred, his fear. Who invented the graphic novel? Goya. Who invented Frankenstein's monster? Goya. Who invented zombies? Goya. Who invented scarecrows? Horror movies? And even Harry Potter? Goya. Pretty much every contemporary darkness you can name is prefigured in the caprichos. They're astonishingly prescient. And Goya knew all this about the monsters produced by the sleep of reason because they were his monsters too. Under the strain of all this brilliant invention, his remarkable mind began to buckle. First, he started going deaf. Then, the panic attacks began. Soon, his own private horror climaxed in a nervous breakdown. On the walls of his house, outside Madrid, he began painting his famous black paintings and surrounding himself with their horror. The witches and monsters were no longer a dream. They were there, moved into his house and living on his walls. In Venice, as well, events had now lurched into blackness. In 1796, Napoleon invaded Italy and quickly conquered the Serenissima. The Venetian Republic, which had lasted for a thousand years, was abruptly terminated. Napoleon carted off some of Venice's greatest art treasures to Paris as war booty. A thousand years of history snuffed out just like that. So for politics, these were terrible times. But for art, they were really interesting. This is the Carrizonico, Venice's official museum of the 18th century. And those are the only two canalettos in Venice. Grim ones from his early days. But that's not what we're here for. We're here 
for this. Now that is a strange fresco, right? It was painted by Domenico Tiepolo, son of the great Giambattista. If you remember in film one, there was that magnificent staircase in Würzburg, painted by Tiepolo Sr. And remember the two portraits in the corner, Giambattista Tiepolo on the left, and on the right, his son Domenico, who assisted him. Tiepolo Jr., Domenico Tiepolo, was a really interesting painter too. But while his father was alive, no one was going to notice him. Poor Domenico was fated to spend most of his career in his father's shadow. It was only when Tiepolo Sr. died in 1770 that Domenico came into his own. These strange frescoes were painted for the Tiepolo family house, the Villa Zianigo on the mainland, and they were done for his own amusement, privately. And that's what makes them so telling. This one here was in the entrance hall. Imagine, you walk into the Tiepolo family house and all these people turn their back on you. Why? Because they'd prefer to look at the Magic Lantern show taking place in the background. In Napoleon's Venice, amusement was what the crowd craved, not art. So that was the entrance hall, but look what Tiepolo Jr. painted at the back of the house. A room full of Pulcinellas. Pulcinella was another character in the Commedia dell'arte. A hunchback with a big nose, whose deceitfulness was legendary. This has to be one of the most inventive and outrageous fresco cycles in the whole of Italian art. All these Pulcinellas haven't just visited the room, They've overrun it. They're like a troop of monkeys in a zoo. And I think that's what they're actually meant to be. Human monkeys clambering all over the modern world. Ugly, itchy and ridiculous. Pulcinella, the lecherous Venetian scoundrel, has taken over the fresco spaces formerly occupied by guards and heroes. Where once this ceiling would have shown Apollo riding his chariot or Jesus ascending to heaven, there's now a circus show with a bunch of Pulcinellas clambering along a tightrope. Welcome, says Domenico Tiepolo, to the modern world. You know, Pulcinella here, the ugly Rococo hunchback, was the model for Punch in those Punch and Judy shows you still see at the seaside. And he's always hitting Judy over the head. Just like that. And that's the thing about the Rococo. It never really went away. It's us in our early form. In film one, we saw a society that was always going on holiday. In film two, Ooh, la, la. celebrity and pleasure became the order of the day. And now, in film three, the clowns have taken over, and nothing's serious anymore. The Rococo wasn't just a great creative era, it was a great creative prediction.